Pleasure to be here this morning on a beautiful sunny day. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, insects, my favourite subject. Now just bear with me while I share my screen with you. Uh, this is always a bit of a, a moment of truth because it sometimes goes a little wrong, but this is looking very promising. Uh, just pause a second while it thinks. And any second now we should have it in slideshow. There we go. Marvellous. So, yes, insects. Um, I, I've been fascinated by insects all my life. Um, I don't know why, but from the age of four or five or six or something like that, I, I, one of my earliest memories is um, finding these little yellow and black caterpillars on some weeds at the edge of the school playground and, and collecting them and putting them in my lunchbox and taking them home and rearing them up. And eventually they hatched into these beautiful black and red moths and I, I was just completely captivated. I thought this was magic. Uh, cinnabar moths you might recognize. Um, and I, I've been lucky enough to, to, to be, find a way to make a living from studying insects. So I've, I've, I've been uh, able to kind of pursue my childhood hobby, which is great. Um, now, actually, I think many people go through a kind of bug phase when they're young. Uh, this is my um, youngest son, Seth, with his pet cockchafer, Colin. Sadly, Colin's no longer with us, but, um, but Seth was very fond of him while he lasted. And he's really fascinated by insects, as are, as are many kids. But the sad reality is that many of us grow out of that as we get older. And the reaction of most teenagers or adults to uh, something buzzing near them is usually to try and swat it and kill it. They think it's it's going to bite them or sting them or give them a disease or do something. I'm not quite sure, but it's they're, they're frightened um, and they don't appreciate insects. And I think that's really sad. Um, uh, so my kind of mission in life is to try and persuade people to love insects or at the very least to respect insects because they're hugely important. But before I say more about insects, let's look at the, at the bigger picture. So obviously this, this you probably recognize, um, it's where we live, it's our home, it's this extraordinary rock hurtling through space with five, maybe 10 million species clinging to its surface. We, we don't know, we're a long, long way from cataloging the diversity of life on Earth. Um, we've named about one and a half million species so far, but that total goes up all the time. Um, and so it's our home, it's our source of food and water and air and, and, and inspiration and beauty. It's, it's everything. Um, and, and therefore it, it's, it's really tragic and ridiculous and absurd that we aren't looking after it. That we're, we are doing terrible damage to this amazing, beautiful planet. Um, of course, we're all familiar with most of these issues, and I don't want to, I haven't got time to go through them all in any detail, but climate change clearly is a massive threat to, to the future of life on our planet, as we know it at least. But that, although climate change tends to get the bulk of the attention, there are a whole bunch of other interrelated environmental catastrophes unraveling right now. We're eroding the world's soils at a terrifying rate. We're polluting soils and seas and rivers and the air with plastics and heavy metals and fertilizers and pesticides and so on and so on. Um, you know these, I, I won't go through them all. We, we see these terrible images on the television of the, the Amazon burning and, and so on. Um, my real focus, of course, is on biodiversity loss. Um, and uh, we are now, scientists agree, in the midst of the, the sixth mass extinction event. So right now, species are going extinct um, uh, faster than they have for 65 million years uh, since the dinosaurs went extinct uh, when a meteor struck. Um, and the, the, but this extinction event is unique because it's, it's the first one that's been caused by a species on the planet us, of course. And right now, species are going extinct somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times the natural average historical rate, um, which means that, that perhaps um, during this one hour session today, a species somewhere will go extinct. That's roughly one an hour. And the extinction rate is accelerating, uh, which is pretty terrifying. 
Now, most people focus on, when you talk about extinctions, they think about uh, polar bears or pandas or large uh, mammals and birds tend to get the bulk of attention. Um, and it was only really quite recently that people began to appreciate that it isn't just these large creatures that are going extinct, but the small creatures that we pay much less attention to are also in deep trouble. And I think that this really came to the fore of people's appreciation back in three years ago in 2017, when a paper was published from Germany. Um, it was uh, based on malaise trap uh, data. So that funny thing, top right there, is a malaise trap. And uh, it, it, it catches flying insects, all types of flying insects. Uh, and the, what the chart shows you is the, the daily catch per trap and how it changed between 1989 and 2016. Um, and as you can see, it fell. The, the catch, the weight of insects caught each day fell. It fell by 76% in 26 years. So essentially three quarters of the insects, this is right across Germany, seemed to have disappeared in really quite a short period, about half my lifetime. Uh, and this is really worrying. And if this were the only data set that showed this, we might dismiss it as a quirk or a fluke. Perhaps something weird is happening in Germany. But I could show you, sadly, many other similar charts. For example, we know in the UK that our butterfly populations are down by roughly 60% since 1976. Um, uh, so th this, as far as we know, is a general phenomenon, certainly in, in, in Europe and North America, where we have good long-term data on some insects, they're disappearing. And that should really worry us um, because insects are vitally important. As was put quite nicely by E.O. Wilson, an American biologist, and I won't read this out to you, but he, um, he basically said it, if we people were to somehow suddenly disappear from the planet, the planet would do really well without us. Um, but if insects were to vanish, as he put it, the environment would collapse into chaos. Uh, and he's absolutely right, and I want to explain why. So, uh, insects make up the majority of biodiversity. They, uh, of the one and a half million species we've named so far, um, one million are different types of insect. Um, so, so they are biodiversity, or a very big chunk of it. And they're also food for a very large proportion of the remainder of species. Uh, most birds, bats, amphibians, reptiles, freshwater fish, all feed upon insects. So if you're a, one of these beautiful bee eaters uh, living in Germany, for example, then three quarters of your food supply has disappeared in the last 26 years, um, which is obviously gonna have major impacts on, on anything that relies on insects for food. Insects do many other things too. Um, so that because there are so many of them and they're so diverse, they're involved in more or less every ecological process one might think of. They're vitally important by control agents of pests. They are intimately involved in, in recycling of all sorts of organic materials from cow pats to dead bodies, to tree trunks, to leaves and so on. And they play a really important role in keeping the soil healthy and sequestering carbon. And you name it, they're involved in it happening, uh, which is why um, Ed Wilson said, if the insects weren't there, things would collapse into chaos. Of course, the thing that insects do that, that we appreciate best, I think, is they pollinate. 87% um, of all the plant species in the world need pollinating by some kind of um, animal. And in a few cases, that's done by birds, hummingbirds and so on, or even bats in a few instances. But the very large majority of those plant species rely upon some kind of insect. Um, not just bees, I should stress. Pollinators include many other types of insects, including butterflies and moths, numerous species of flies, um, wasps, beetles, and so on, all get in on the act. And between them, they pollinate the large majority of plant species on Earth and 75% of all the crops that we grow. So if we didn't have um, insect pollinators, then our supermarkets would not look like this. We wouldn't have this extraordinary... Uh, bounty, this, this range of beautiful fruits and veg that come from all over the world year round, um, things would look rather different without the pollinators. We wouldn't have everything from apples and strawberries and raspberries to 
um, squashes, peppers, tomatoes, chili peppers, even things like um, coffee and chocolate depend upon insect pollinators. So life would be dire indeed. Um, and in fact, the, the, we couldn't feed the human population without them. Um, literally uh, millions, perhaps billions of people would die. Um, so it's, it's pretty important that we look after these little things. To do that, we need to understand why they're declining. Um, and uh, this is quite a complicated subject. We know there are many causes of insect declines and I haven't got time to go into them. Um, from a UK perspective, perhaps the biggest driver has been the loss of flower rich uh, grassland habitats, which we used to have uh, enormous areas of. Um, so uh, this is a beautiful example of a surviving piece of flower rich grassland. I took that photograph in South Uist in the Outer Hebrides. Um, a hundred years ago, Britain had about 7 million hectares of this kind of habitat, lowland hay meadows and chalk downland. Uh, and we lost 97% of it in the 20th century. It was all swept away and replaced with either monocultures of ryegrass for pasture or with monocultures of crops like this. And it's self-evident really why that from an insect's perspective is catastrophic. Now an integral part of the way, it's not just that the habitat has been lost, but what it's been replaced with is now treated with lots of pesticides. Um, just to give you, this is quite a, a big subject and I could give you a whole talk about pesticide use and its impacts on the environment. But um, in the UK, farmers currently apply 16.9 thousand tonnes of pesticides to the landscape every year. Um, and each field on average gets just over 17 applications per year. And that's a mix of insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, molluscicides. Basically, we try to kill anything that, that, that dares to live in our fields um, and grow a sort of, a, 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 have a, a field which just has one species in it, nothing else at all, the crop, um, which as I'll come back to later, seems like a nuts way to try to grow food to me. Anyway, um, uh, of course, it's not just farmers that use pesticides. You can pop to your garden centre or even your supermarket and buy a whole range of pesticides. And I think that's completely nuts myself. Um, uh, and even if you don't buy pesticides uh, and perhaps you're keen on making your garden wildlife friendly, um, you might well buy bee friendly plants from your local garden centre. They're usually labelled as such, often with the RHS's Perfect for Pollinator logo there. Um, now, we recently did some research on these plants. We bought uh, plants from all the big name garden centres, DIY shops, places like B&Q and Homebase. Um, we bought just the bee friendly plants and we screened them for pesticides and 98% of them contained pesticides, most of them multiple pesticides, 75% of them contained insecticides. And these are being sold as bee friendly, so clearly they're not as, as bee friendly as you thought. Okay, so that's a very quick skim through why insects may be declining, or at least some of the factors. What can we do about it? Well, the good news is that there is lots we can do about it. Um, many of these conservation issues are really doom and gloom and you feel absolutely helpless about the Amazons in flames or the ice caps melting or whatever. Um, but insects live all around us. They live in our, in our, in our gardens, they live in our local parks. Um, so we can all get involved and most of them haven't gone extinct yet and unlike rhinos insects can breed really quickly so they can recover in no time at all if we just give them the right conditions uh, and so for most of the rest of my talk I'm going to focus on uh, I, something that I'm really keen on which is that we could welcome insects in to live in our urban areas um, and that that could provide a, a network of habitat that could support an enormous diversity of insect life. Um, there are 22 million gardens in the UK covering an area of nearly half a million hectares, which is a bigger area than all of our nature reserves. Just imagine if all of those were insect friendly and if all the parks and the road verges and the roundabouts and so on were also um, insect friendly, then that's a, that's a ready-made network. And there's not really any downside there's no cost to pay uh, to inviting insects to live in our cities. 
I got so excited about this that I wrote a book about it. Sorry to plug my book, but there you go, The Garden Jungle. And essentially the point I try to make in the book is that gardening can be good or bad. Um, people think of gardening as a, as a green activity. Um, and it can be, it's possible to have a garden which captures carbon and which teems with life. And it's also possible to, to be a gardener who does terrible harm, who creates a garden that's almost sterile and that has huge impacts on the environment. And you can guess what I think this one is. This is a, my idea of hell. Um, this is actually a garden which has been astroturfed, it's plastic grass. You can even buy plastic ivy these days to, to pin to your plastic fence. Um, it's thoroughly depressing. Um, and this stuff is being widely used. But uh, of course, most people don't go quite that far, but many people's idea of gardening is to jump in the car, drive to the garden center, uh, get a big trolley, buy a plastic sack full of peat-based compost, buy some fertilizer, some pesticide bottles, some pretty flowers grown in disposable plastic pots, probably reared in peat, probably treated with lots of pesticides and throw them all in the trolley spend lots of money and then plant them in the garden and sprinkle all the chemicals around. That's not very green. It has enormous environmental impacts. But gardens can be amazing places. There was uh, one really interesting example of, uh, there's a lady called Jenny Owen who uh, gardened in, she had a, a small, very small garden in urban Leicester. And she spent 35 years cataloguing how many species she could find in her garden. Um, and she managed to, to, to find 2,600 different species uh, of organism living in her garden, about 2,000 of which were insects. So gardens can be biodiversity hotspots or they can be devoid of life like this one. So how do we make them more wildlife friendly? Well, um, we get rid of the pesticides for a start. I would love to see pesticides completely banned in urban areas. Um, I think there's just no excuse for them. They're, these are poisons that we can buy without any training and spray around in our garden where our children play, where our dogs play and so on. It's absolutely nuts. France, I should say, have banned all pesticides for urban use and I think that's brilliant. I'd also encourage people to, to mow less. This is a really, really simple time-saving, money-saving uh, thing that everyone can do if they have a lawn. Uh, and instead of trying to aspire to have a kind of Wimbledon tennis court with stripes on it in your garden, why not have a garden, a, a lawn like this one? This is my lawn and all I do is not mow very often. I never planted any wildflowers in it at all. It's full of flowers that just spring up if you stop mowing. And it'd be great if every lawn, I think, looked like that one. It'd also be great if we could plant more of the right kinds of flowers. Now, you might think all flowers would be good for um, uh, for insects or pollinators because the flower, that's what a flower is for. Flowers evolved, of course, not to look pretty, um, but to attract pollinators. That's the function of the colourful petals and the scent and everything else. But unfortunately, we've tinkered with plants. We've plant breeders have played around with flowers, made them uh, more attractive to us humans, or at least what they thought was more attractive. But often in doing so, they've made them less attractive or in fact, sometimes completely unattractive to insects and double varieties of flowers are a really nice example of that. So here we've got um, double roses, double cherries, double hollyhocks along the top. And then the single versions closer to the kind of more natural wild uh, flowers below. And the ones at the bottom are really attractive to insects. The ones at the top are absolutely useless. They're mutants in which the anthers that normally produce the pollen have mutated into extra petals. So they're just a bundle of petals with no pollen in the middle. Complete waste of time from an, and I, I should say also, I think they're rather hideous too. So um, I strongly encourage you next time you're buying a plant to avoid a double variety. Um, and generally aim for traditional cottage garden flowers, herbs and so on. There's tons of information out there about which ones are best. Um, including YouTube videos from me. So if you want some top tips for which plants to grow in your garden to encourage pollinators, uh, go online and find me on YouTube and I'll tell you more. Um, I'd also encourage people to be more tolerant of weeds. We've sort of arbitrarily declared some plants undesirable and we spend a lot of time and effort trying to get rid of them. 
but actually most of them are native wildflowers. All of these are native wildflowers, actually rather beautiful. These are all ones that I grow in my garden and the insects love them, they look great. I don't quite understand why we're so obsessed by trying to kill them all the time. A uh, couple of other little things you might do in, in your garden. You might make a bee hotel. Uh, these are really easy to make um, with a piece of wood and a drill or some bits of bamboo. Um, great little projects, things that you could do with the kids. Um, get them ready for early spring when the red mason bees top right emerge and might occupy them. Uh, and later in the year, if you're lucky, you'll get leaf cutter bees bottom right there, uh, occupying the same things. They're really cool. Um, or you might make a hoverfly lagoon. Ooh, I, for some reason, my pictures of hoverfly lagoons have all vanished. Um, sorry about that. Uh, a hoverfly lagoon, again, you can find a YouTube video about how to make one, um, is a small puddle, yeah, any waterproof container, fill it with water, um, put in some, some lawn clippings or uh, leaves that have fallen off the trees and let it, as soon as they start to rot down, the smell will attract female hoverflies of certain species that have aquatic larvae. Uh, hoverfly lagoons, look them up online. It's a really, again, a fun little project to do with the kids. And one more, why not also, while you're at it, make an earwig hotel. Uh, I love earwigs. I've written a whole chapter about them in my book and they're really, really easy to provide little refuges for like this one made out of a flower pot stuffed full of straw. Okay, I'm nearly finished. Um, I was supposed to try and keep to 20 minutes-ish. Um, so I've talked about gardens and how we could make gardens wildlife friendly, welcome insects in to live with us in our cities. And that would be great. It would be great for biodiversity. Um, it would be great for our children to grow up in gardens surrounded by bumblebees and butterflies and so on. But the reality is the majority of the countryside is farmland. The majority of Britain is farmland. 70% of Britain is farmland. And even if all of our gardens were great for insects, that would still leave the majority of our land pretty much hostile, inhospitable to, to wildlife. Um, now, I haven't got time to go into this. This is really, it needs another talk. Um, but I have a really strong view that the current farming system is fundamentally broken. Uh, we've gone down this route of intensive monoculture farming in big fields with lots of chemicals. Uh, and it simply isn't sustainable in the long term. Um, it's doing terrible damage to biodiversity. It's wiping out the pollinators that are necessary um, to, to pollinate the crops. Um, it's doing terrible damage to the soil, causing staggering soil erosion around the world. Uh, and of course, it's contributing greatly to climate change, to carbon emissions. Uh, food production broadly um, contributes about a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so we absolutely have to find a way to feed everybody, but it needs to be sustainable. Um, by definition, we shouldn't be growing food in a way that can't be sustained long term. And there are lots of alternative ways uh, of farming, which actually work with nature rather than against it in essence. I could tell you more, but we'll leave that for another day or perhaps for the discussion afterwards. Broadly, to come back to where I started, you know, this is our amazing planet. Uh, it's a cliche to say, you've heard it before, but there is no planet B. We are not going to be going to live on Mars. And frankly, I wouldn't want to. Um, we have this amazing place and we desperately should look after it. I find it really bizarre that, you know, people would do anything for their children, wouldn't they? Apart from, it seems, leave them a decent planet to live on. Um, I, I, we can do better, we have to do better, and maybe we can start by looking after the wildlife in our own gardens. Thank you everybody for listening.